Hi, how are you? I am Roy Ronald Mwizere, and as we prepare for the first ever Medical Expo, I'm joined by two fantastic doctors and would like to know what's, a few things about what happens in the medical field and in layman language. I've, I don't understand medical terms, so I'm hoping to understand better today with our two esteemed doctors. We have uh, Swalha. Hello. Um, my name is Dr. Naukera Swalha Renzaho, and um, I work with the Children's Clinic, Nalia Nigeria Chisasi, and i um, joined today with Dr. Hi, Dr. Kiza Blair is my name, um, medical doctor by profession. I work at Aga Khan University Hospital, based in Nairobi. I'm very happy to be here. I'm more than thrilled to be part of this. Yes. Nice. Welcome, doctors. Now, I'm going to ask what I find one of the most basic questions, but as, uh, as people out there, we may not even know what the answer really is, but we hear you say it as you diagnose mostly children, but also adults. You tell us you have a bacterial infection. What is a bacterial infection? And that's to you, Dr. Swahla. Okay, a bacterial infection is basically when uh, the body is invaded by a harmful bacteria. Yes, uh, in our environment and even on our bodies, we have so much bacteria. But you find like the biggest percentage of bacteria surrounding us and on our bodies is harmless bacteria with a very small percentage of harmful bacteria, yes? A bacteria is basically a one cellular organism that is able to multiply within our bodies and outside our bodies. That is what differentiates it from a virus. A virus doesn't have a cell, so the only way that it can reproduce is in our bodies. That's why it causes more diseases than bacterial infections. Actually, you find that the biggest percentage of infections we have in the world as a whole are viral infections. But the smaller percentage is bacterial infections. However, because these bacteria are virulent or are harmful, they cause very, very bad symptoms. So the symptoms come about by, if this bacteria enters your body, the body recognizes it, and then uh, basically what it does, it raises temperature to try to kill this bacteria. Um, it uh, also, the body recognizes this bacteria and produces what we call interleukins, or cytokines, and these cytokines also are responsible for other symptoms. So basically, when the bacteria enters your body, the body recognizes it, and now the body is what is responsible for the symptoms that we get. Yeah, basically interesting, that's interesting. it. Interesting, yeah. A lot of jargon in there, oh, but, but still, uh, <laughs> I, I feel I have understood it better today than I have before, so yeah. thank you for attempting to, <laughs> to explain. Dr. Blair, mm. what is the prevalence of, uh, of bacterial infections in Uganda? Okay. Uh, so we have a very huge burden when it comes to bacterial infections in the country and even globally. The uh, problem is uh, we lack measures uh, in place to make sure that we don't have these bacterial infections in the country. But you look at uh, the last statistics that we had done were as far as 2019, so we need to update our statistics. But according to those statistics, we show that... Uh, actually more than, we get more than 20 million bacterial infections in at least every quarter, every three months, we're having a burden of over 20 million. Look at our population, like 44, 45, I think. But if you see that we're having more than half of the population having bacterial infections at least every three months, that is a very huge burden. But if I'm to go down to break them down, which ones are the most common ones? The most common ones are diarrheal illnesses. I mean, you know, every, every after week, every after month, someone ends up with, with, with a loose motion. Someone is running to the toilet with, with either, you know, loose motions or vomiting. So pretty much of that is, is what contributes, is what is representative of the bacterial infections that we have. Now, it gets more dangerous when it comes to children because children just diarrhea for one to three days and they can actually die from that. But there are your illnesses, uh, they rank up there. Now, second, we go to lower respiratory tract infections. I'm very sure even parents out there must have had something called pneumonia. Oh, my child has a pneumonia, my child has a pneumonia. So pneumonia is, is, is one of the infections that actually are caused by bacterial infections. Not entirely bacteria, but even viruses can cause pneumonias, even other organisms, but even bacterial infections can cause the pneumonias that we see. So 
sudario illnesses, then we've seen lower respiratory tract infections, then there is TB, you must have heard of TB, tuberculosis. tuberculosis. Yeah. So tuberculosis is actually a bacterial infection. It's a very unique bacterial infection, so they tend to separate it. So dairy illnesses, lower respiratory tract infections, tuberculosis, then others follow like skin infections, bone infections, brain infections, and so on and so forth. As Dr. Swallow will, will, will explain in the next uh, section on what, what are some of the different parts of the body that bacterial infections can, can actually... Actually, I think we should get straight into yeah. that, Dr. Swallow. Actually, yeah. so, uh, bacterial infections can affect every single part of your body, from your hair to the bone to the cell. So you find that there is a vast number of bacterial infections a person can have. They can have an infection of the hair follicle, which we call folliculitis. They can have an infection of the eye, which we call conjunctivitis. They can get an infection of the throat, which we call a pharyngitis. They can get an infection on the ear. They can get an infection on the skin. I think you've seen people with skin infections. Yeah, yeah a certain percentage of that is caused by bacterial infections. Um, for example, in Petaigo, I don't know if you've heard of that. In Petaigo, where no, I there is, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, then also we look at the respiratory system, the yeah. upper and the lower respiratory system, like Dr. Blair has said. Uh, for the lower respiratory system that usually is con uh, consistent of the lungs, yeah. we look at TB, we look at pneumonia as a, as a consequence of a bacterial infection. Then we look at the intestines, the gut, the stomach, the small intestines, the large intestines. You can also get a bacterial infection in your gut. Yes, and the consequence of this is the different symptoms you find that we're going to talk about, the diarrhea, the abdominal pain. And then also the bacteria can also infect your urinary tract system. Yeah. Hence the UTIs that you hear about. Yeah, those are mostly bacterial infections that cause that. Then uh, we also go to the bones themselves. They can also get bacterial infections. The so-called osteomyelitis. They can also get uh, bacterial infection in the bones. Yeah. So to just sum it up all together, I don't want to put a lot of medical jargon. Yeah. Yeah. What what, what would you say are the most common bacterial infections that yeah. we experience? So like uh, Dr. Blair said, in Uganda, the prevalence of bacterial infections ranks from, from uh, infections in the gut to yeah. respiratory tract infections, then the others follow. Because you also see in children that these are the things that children suffer from most. Yeah, they always come with diarrhea, diarrhea, diarrhea symptoms, abdominal pain, and usually they get this from ingesting food. We're going to talk about the preventative measures later on, but they get it from ingesting food. For the respiratory tract infections, you know they are school going, so the environments, they're usually in the play areas. Like I said, bacteria is everywhere. So they in, in, inhale uh, the so-called bacteria or somites from the dust, uh, from the desks, from everywhere. Now, when I get infected or when a child gets infected, that bacteria is going to multiply in my body. So I'm going to spread it to others. How? By coughing, by sneezing. So this is how this bacteria spreads around people. Understand just like viruses, but bacteria also do the same. Is it more common in uh, adults or children? Uh, the respiratory tract infections and uh, gastroenteritis or yes. the infection of the stomach is usually common in children. Actually, you find that about 50% of the 34,000 people who actually get the bacterial infections in the gut and the chest area are children. Yeah, the ones that suffer the most. Why? Because the image is not well developed they are always uh in contact with soil dust they're always in crowded places so you see that's why they get infected most and for adults we have better preventative measures we're not usually in crowded places uh we make sure we don't eat anything that we find you realize that children even when something has fallen on the ground they just pick it up and eat yeah. by the way i want to debunk that uh five second rule it doesn't work are you serious yes as long as you just killed that something <laughs> drops on the floor, <laughs> let it go. Let it go, because this thing of saying bacteria is slow. Yeah. Trust me, it's the fastest thing in the world. If have you seen a bee move now, just multiply that by a thousand. So you get it. By the time you get it, bacteria is already <laughs> done and you ingest it. Actually, interestingly, yeah. I've, I've also had people say that actually at night 
<laughs> some of those bacteria are asleep. Yeah. Yeah. So I you, imagine you, they rest as well. They, they don't. They don't. They don't tire. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Always awake. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> Talking about that, I would like to know what. Uh, how can we prevent um, getting bacterial infections? Okay. Um, that's a very interesting question. Uh, well, uh, when it comes to prevention, we actually have measures already in place. Uh, maybe just you know to amplify them, you know, try to make people understand that these measures are in place to help us to to prevent most of these infections from actually you know coming onto us. So vaccinations, very very important. So the WHO, the Ministry of Health in Uganda, you know we have a whole we have a schedule for the different vaccines and when to get them. But you find that some people are pro-vax, some are anti-vax. The same, the same way you see how corona vaccination was, there are very many people who are actually against vaccinations and they prefer not to vaccinate their children against anything. So you find that you're missing out on a very important aspect of protection from certain terrible infections. I've seen it in my practice. I've seen children who are coming with infections that actually we thought they should, it shouldn't exist in this modern time. And why is that? It's because this person never took their child for vaccination. Maybe they didn't do it intentionally. Maybe there was no vaccination coverage in their area. But if you have a chance to go for vaccination, it's very, very important to go for vaccination. Even if you're born at home, it's okay. Just take the child for vaccination. It's never too late. So certain infections like TB, we actually get an, a vaccine for TB immediately when you're born. Like shortly after you're born, we give you a vaccine for TB. So that's why we are seeing that how TB was 20, 30 years ago, it's quite very different to how it is today. We're actually in the process of getting the exact TB vaccine, but this is some immunity that we get from that vaccination we receive at birth. Uh, certain other infections, like you've heard of meningitis. Yeah, we actually get a vaccine for meningitis. I don't know what it is in real life. Yeah, because you know when you look at West Africa, you kind of you can actually cross from one country to the other that getting the you know the meningitis meningitis vaccine, and so on and so forth. Other preventative, other preventative uh, mechanisms that we can actually put in place, we have seen that uh, the, the largest burden that we have in the country are actually diarrheal illnesses. Yeah. For example, a child has eaten something funny. For example, you didn't wash your hands. You didn't wash your plate. You didn't wash your fork. You don't wash your bed sheets. You don't change the boxer that you wear all the time. Some of that information is, uh, is critical. Mm. People don't change bed sheets for sleep on the same bed sheets for one, two, two months and wonder why you keep falling sick. <laughs> You're using the same toothbrushes year in, year out. Yeah. You take candy all the time. So you look at everything that we do in life puts us at risk from to getting bacterial infections. Yeah. You don't use protection in having sex. Because you see even STDs, most of them like gonorrhea. Yeah. In Lima, they call it Enziku and Duadea Bazira. It's very, very common. Yeah. But people only test for HIV and that's it. Yeah. So, so in, when, when we look at the measures, we have to, you know, to modify our lifestyle in terms of hand washing. Very important. It's not only for COVID. Yeah. It, we don't. We shouldn't stop the habit because COVID is no more. COVID. I know, right? Yeah. But, but it's very, very important. Before you eat food, wash your hands. You know, distance yourself. People are having TB. You're in a car, but even doors are closed. Everyone is coughing inside there. Definitely, you end up getting an infection that you have no idea about. Protection, very important. We don't only use condoms because we don't want to get HIV. There are very many other diseases, including bacterial infections. They can actually come, out, come, out, come along if you don't actually protect yourself. Mm -hmm. When it comes to ladies, we've seen that um, women tend to get more urinary tract infections. Uh, their risk is heightened by the act of having sex. Note that they spread, they get UTIs through sexual intercourse, but Everything that surrounds sexual intercourse puts them at a risk of getting urinary tract infections. So it is very, very prudent. Shortly after sex, you go and urinate. Something that most people wouldn't know, actually. Yeah. Is so that you, for ladies only or even gentlemen? Even gentlemen, but most of the times ladies that yeah. get that protection. So you urinate and let everything out before it colonizes and stays there. So, you know, there are certain habits that, you know, it's a whole big list yeah. that actually, we have to actually, walk through. Actually, for men, why I want to recommend uh, hygiene after sex is because, especially for the uncircumcised men, they have this foreskin. So when they don't clean themselves after, usually we, there is a certain um, virus. And we are talking about an, a bac bac bacteria, but there is a certain virus called HPV that is responsible for cancer of the cervix. 
Yes, I don't know. And it is sexually transmitted too. So you would rather, after having sex, you go clean up, wash your first skin. Yeah. You know, you, 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 you at least find a way of minimizing the virus mm. that, that would colonize your genital area too. Yeah. Mm. And then for women, UTIs, like you say, let me, let me throw more light because I think most people do not know about how to maintain the hygiene in order to prevent UTIs. Now, let me talk about usage of toilets for women. Yeah. Most women say they, that, that they get UTIs from toilet seats, which is actually not true. Is it? Yeah. They don't get, you do not get a UTI from a toilet seat. You do not get a UTI by having sexual intercourse by a, with another person. However, the sexual intercourse is going to pave way for you to get a UTI. You can't spread it that I have discharge as a man. I'm going to put the discharge in no man's urethra. No. The process of sex, which sometimes is rough, you will find that uh, the proximity of the urethra or the opening to the urinary tract of a woman is very proximal to the anal area. And most cases during sex, bacteria can be transferred from the anal opening to the urethral opening. That is how bacteria actually gets transferred. To, but a man doesn't give it to her. It's just the process. Now for you, for, for toilet seat, yeah. the best thing that you can do, because I know there are so many controversies around this, some yeah. say yes, some say they get infection from toilet seat, some say they don't. Yeah. So the best thing that you can do as a lady is to have enough tissue with you. If you could, you even get a, a peri bottle with water okay. as you're going to use the toilet. Number one, go wash your hands before you, you use the toilet. Line and clean your toilet seat. Yeah. You can even line the bowel. Make sure you sit properly because this uh, motion, this motion of sitting, actually helps you put pressure on your bladder, so you completely void the urine. Because the more you don't completely void these things of women going and squatting on the toilet, yeah. you don't completely void the urine, and in in uh, in consequence, this urine is going to stay in the bladder and it's going to become uh, basically a breathing area. And that is how you get the urinary tract infection. Not that you have got it from the toilet seat. So I think we also need to educate women more about that. And also use your use use the bath use the bathroom and wash your hands after. Very very important. Yes. Yeah, very good information. I don't think we even care to know about. We, we really like you don't. said, we have our own assumptions on what happens, and we go with that. Um, a thing that I find quite interesting is when I have children, and whenever I take them to to the clinic, mm. I feel like one of the excuses <laughs> when a doctor is not too sure about uh, their illness, they'll always tell me he has a, ba a bacterial infection. Yeah, sure. Half of the time, to be honest, I don't even believe it. Yeah. I feel it, it's they're just basic things that they've decided and they're not getting into depth uh, for. So it, it begs the question, how do you actually diagnose bacterial infection? Uh, are, are there specific things we as uh, the, the parents or people who might uh, have bacterial infections are able to tell and know that based on one to three things, it's actually a bacterial infection? I know I'm not trying to eliminate the role of a doctor, but you also want to listen to a doctor and you understand because you, you, you understand what they're saying. So are there are specific things we can look at. Uh, thank you so much for that question. You're very, you're, very, you're very right. I've seen it several times. Uh, most doctors want to get away with it by saying you have a bacterial infection. It's very, very wrong. It's unethical. It's very important to always explain to the patient in depth of what exactly they're having. As a patient, it's, it's up to you to ask. It's your right. If someone tells you you have a bacterial infection, tell me where. So that's where the big question comes. Where's the bacterial infection? The focus of the infection. The focus of the infection. Yeah. Because you can't just throw in a word like bacterial infection. <laughs> what is bacterial yeah. infection? Because yeah. even when you say to me, I wouldn't understand what, what bacterial infection is. Yes. So you can tell the parents, you see, uh, we have tested, we have done such and such tests for your child. Yeah. And because they have such and such symptoms, yeah. we are suspecting that the focus of the infection is actually the chest or the abdomen, you understand? Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, you can throw in a bit of medical term there. We call it gastroenteritis or we call it pharyngitis. So that someone goes and they're satisfied with what, with what you're telling them. Yeah. So everything has to have a focus. You understand? Yeah, yeah. yeah I think yeah. when you explain yeah. to patients that, like that, they better understand yeah. what exactly you're talking yeah. about. The, the same exact way Dr. Swall has put it, that we've seen that bacteria affect every part of the body. Every part of the body. Because you need to tell me, where's the bacteria? Is it on the nail? Yeah. Yeah. Is it in the bones? Is it in the brain? Is it in the eyes? Is it in the mouth? So it's very, very important to explain to the patient 
in the most basic basic language to make them understand where actually the infection is. But, but jumping away from that, um, different bacterial infections can be tested differently. For example, if you have a skin infection that I think it's a bacterial skin infection, I can actually take a skin sample and take it to the lab and analyze it to find if there is actually any bacteria that is growing. We do what we call culture and sensitivity. Uh, the same way you can get a garden and then you throw seeds and you wait for whatever grows, mm -hmm. even bacteria. We have a culture medium where we throw your sample and we wait to see whatever grows. Mm -hmm. So if something grows, then we say, oh, you have this particular bacteria that is affecting your skin. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's infection with your eyes, most of the times it's very typical that this is how a bacterial infection looks like. Mm -hmm. For example, if someone has an allergy of the eyes, they'll be itching. If you have a bacterial infection of the eyes, they won't itch. You just feel discomfort, turn red, the discharge, discharge will be very, very peculiar for it. Mm -hmm. So for certain bacterial infections, we just tell that according to the way you see the discharge from your eyes, I think you have bacterial conjunctivitis, infection, bacterial infection of the eyes. Now, for uh, certain bacterial infection, for example, if you're looking at infection of the, of the bladder, the renal bladder, I have to take a urine sample for me to tell that you have a bacterial infection. Fine, you can have all the symptoms that I go to the toilet most of the times, urine is burning me, but actually I have to confirm that it's actually a bacterial infection by taking a urine sample. Um, most of the bacterial infections that actually we, we, we tend to look out for, you have to pick a sample for you to be able to tell. Uh, but broadly, uh, they, they tend to take some blood work as well to see uh, the different cell parameters in your body to see if they are reacting to anything. There's something we call a complete blood count, CBC. I think you've heard about it. Yes. CBC, they say the CBC is 20,000, CBC is 25,000 and so on. So it's just, a, it's just uh, a test we do to look at the different cells within your blood to see if they are reacting towards something. If the white blood cell count is elevated, eh, then it means there's something your body is trying to fight. So we can tell that actually you, most, you look like you have a, an infection, but it's very non-specific. If you look at the different types of the white blood cells, they can actually tell you. For example, you have the neutrophils, the lymphocytes, you don't have to know them. But for us, we can look at that picture and we tell if this is the particular white blood cell count that is rising, then most likely having a bacterial infection. So it's up to me to look for where the bacterial infection is so that I can. Okay, okay. Yeah. Focus is. Uh, the focus. I think the key word for me here now is the focus. Yeah. Uh, and, and I noticed that sometimes when we go to the clinics, mm -hmm. the first thing they're going to tell you to do is do a blood um, count. count. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I, <laughs> I reach the point where I'll just go with my child and say, can we just go straight to doing the blood count? Mm -hmm without knowing where the focus is. So it okay. might be wrong. My last and final question to both of you is looking at treatment. Um, I also personally think sometimes the treatment that we get for bacterial infections, whatever it is, will always be antibiotics and a painkiller. Is that the only treatment? Not at all, not at all. Not all bacterial infections actually need antibiotics to be treated, yeah. Because you see that, uh, for example, uh, if you look at diarrheal illnesses, some of the diarrheal illnesses, they don't actually need antibiotics at all. If, for example, you're having diarrhea and you're vomiting, yeah. I wouldn't need to give you antibiotics unless if it goes on for more than two weeks. So all you have to do is take, take a lot of water, you know, take a lot of juice, replace whatever you're losing through the vomiting and the diarrhea. Yeah. But you find that most of the clinics or pharmacies, you know, they're doing us a disservice because they're treating everything with antibiotics. And the problem with that, it comes with resistance. Yeah. So you find that so something as small as uh, that diarrheal illness, mm -hmm. someone is giving you like over three types of antibiotics. And, you know, being as a human, you don't want to complete the treatment. So long as you get better in one or two days, you stop. <laughs> and when they come back, and then you resume after two, three days. The one you kept at home. The one you ah, kept at home. You know? Oh, yeah. That even got spoiled. Even parents have this habit of keeping <laughs> the so syrup. It doesn't expire. It's you nice. get it. Oh, yeah. that's a very they, good they even have They have a habit of keeping those syrups in the fridge. Yeah. Can you no, imagine? I left it in the fridge so it's kawa. Wait, so I thought that's okay. No. Especially if you look at the expiry date and it hasn't expired. The expiry date is for shelf life. 
once you open, open it. a syrup like this, yeah. it's going to get exposed to light, to air. So these molecules are going to change. So the more you keep it for more than the five days that you were told to take it for, yeah. and then you'll be like, okay, the next time I get sick, I'll take the same thing. It's not going to have the same effect. Wow. The, the so-called potency or the effect of this medication is not going to be as it would have been if it was in yeah. Yeah, and then actually to add on Dr. Blair's, uh, <clears throat> he has said uh, this antibiotic usage has become so prevalent. They give you like five antibiotics. And people actually do not know the consequence of self-medicating, taking too many antibiotics. Even now that our fellow clinicians themselves, because of you know the money-making mind that they have, you understand. But in future, we're going to have a very, 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 very big problem. Why? Because Dr. Blair said that there is something called resistance. You're going to develop resistance to medication. That whatever bacteria you're having in your body is not going to be killed by the same medication that you took the other time. So what, what, what happens is the more you get resistance to a certain type of drug, you're going to go for a higher potent drug. Now this high potent drug is going to be more expensive. Now what if you also take it, the medication, but again you get resistant to that? you're going to have to get a more potent drug. It's yeah. going to be more expensive. And actually, the truth is, antibiotics have their limits. Now, once you are resistant to all of them, the next thing that is going to happen is your infection is going to, not going to cure and you're going to die. Yeah, we just have to watch you die. Yeah. Painfully, watch but you die. Mm, yeah. I, I, think, I think you've seen it where they say that there's a drug we want to get for you, but it's in Nairobi. Yes. Even in Nairobi, that drug will be there. And then people in Nairobi also, the drugs that we say, eh, this India. drug, I think we'll have to order from India for yeah. you. So it means problems come with resistance to the common things that we have in the country, which are cheap and available. Now, if we can't get what we have in the country, then we have to seek for countries that are a bit more developed. Yeah. For example, Nairobi tends to get most of the drugs and they're available there. So say, let's get from Nairobi. Now, in case the drugs in Nairobi, you're also resistant to them. you will have to say, you know what? I think we order from Germany or order from UK. So see, an infection that would have costed you over 20,000, you're now in millions and millions and millions. I think what, what, what I've really liked with this chat is we've reached a point where we sort of predict what uh, the doctor is going to tell us, and we've started self-medicating. Yes. And because of that self-medicating, first, we don't know the focus. <laughs> that one. Yes, we do not know the focus. So we're treating whatever we find, and this is what will happen at the end. Our bodies will start... Um, will not react to, uh, to, to this medication anymore. People. You know, there's a drug I used the other time. Yeah. I have it. Just go to the pharmacy and get and, this and one. Buy this. Actually, the pharmacists are lucky doing us a disservice because they're not supposed to prescribe medication. But because they have that money-making mentality, yeah. the, the people go, Oh, so I have this and this uh, problem. Yeah. Give me medication. You know, they will prescribe very wrong things, very potent drugs, and yeah. actually that's also a conduit of getting resistance. Yeah. Mm, the same way you go to a restaurant and you say, mm. I'm hungry, which food do you which have? Do you and you don't have? know what you want. Yeah, I'll tell you I have chicken. I'll start with the big things. Exactly. Yeah. I have chicken, I have goat's I have meat. I want to sell expensive and then you, syrup, you know? You end up on plain chips. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you very much, Dr. Swahla and, and uh, Dr. Yeah. Blair. Yes. Swalha. Yes. Dr. Swalha and Dr. Blair. I know we could go on and on about this topic, but the interesting part is from the 7th to the 9th of September, we will be having our medical expo. And at the medical expo, all this information will be given to us by different doctors from different spaces, from different professions. We're going to learn a lot more about how to identify some of these illnesses and the right people to speak to and places we can go to and get uh, the right medication. So thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to having more discussions with you, especially from the 7th to the 9th of September. See you there.